Okay, guys, why don't you uh, grab your Bibles with me and open to the book of Acts. We're in the 20th chapter. For you note takers, the title of this message is The Ideal Minister. So, Paul is saying farewell here. He's saying goodbye. And that can be tough. Saying goodbye to to close friends, those that you have a bond of love with in the spirit, um, that can be very challenging. And so the Apostle Paul, he's going to have uh, some of his most loved and, and close brethren in the Lord meet him, the Ephesian elders, as he's going to say farewell to them. And so we're going to step into the middle of chapter 20, where we will pick up in verse 17, where we left off from last week's study in Paul's farewell address. Let's pray together before we go any further. Heavenly Father, I just thank you that we can have your word And Lord, to hear and to read of the ministry of this man that we have grown to love, a man that you chose as a special vessel to turn people from darkness to light. And we are still reading of his activity and of his words, which you gave, which you inspired. Lord, I just ask that for us as your church, that you would uh, help us to internalize what we hear And to take in, Lord, the message that you have for your church. May you speak to us this morning, God. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, the Apostle Paul is quite the leader, isn't he? But he also has a very tender pastor heart. And um, I've titled this message, The Ideal Minister, because... I think in many ways he is the ideal minister. But there was a writer um, who thought that he had the right idea of the ideal pastor. And this is what he said. This was his conception of the ideal pastor. He said, he must preach exactly 20 minutes. And he has to condemn sin, but he can never hurt anyone's feelings. He has to work from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. in every type of work, and he has to find time for preaching. He dresses for everyone's tastes. He reads all the latest books and has a nice family. He is 26 years old and has been preaching for 30 years. (laughs) He is tall and short, thin and heavy set, plain looking but handsome. One brown eye and one blue eye. He works with the youth and also spends all of his time with the older folks. He smiles all the time with a straight face because he has a sense of humor that keeps him seriously dedicated to his work. He makes 15 calls a day. He spends the rest of his time evangelizing the lost and is never out of the office. He's a remarkable person. He doesn't exist. But in Paul's last words to the Ephesian elders, we do read of this ideal minister, a minister who was ideal in God's eyes, a man bound to Christ whose life we should emulate, a servant of the master. And in this farewell address, he's just going to open his heart as he talks to the leadership of the church of Ephesus. So verse 17 begins, Let's start here. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. This passage here is one of three special addresses in the book of Acts so far. Back in chapter 13, Paul spoke to the Jewish synagogue, to a large crowd of Jews. In Acts chapter 17, we found that Paul spoke to a mass of Gentiles on Mars Hill. And now this address to these church elders from the city of Ephesus, who are the leaders of the church. 
Paul's mission has been on his third missionary journey to strengthen the churches that he had planted in previous trips. And, and so now we see this transition from strengthening churches, traveling around the Mediterranean there, to then beginning to make his way back to Jerusalem. He is en route and he's heading for Jerusalem because he would like to be there, Lord willing, before the Passover. And so he comes from nearby Miletus, it says. That's where his ship would have stopped. And there on the Mediterranean Sea, there's a map here that shows the Mediterranean. There's a map. There it is. With uh, right across from Patmos, right towards the middle there, and across from Caria, the region, there was the little port of Miletus. And it was about 30 miles from Ephesus. And so Paul says, hey, why don't you guys just walk on over and I'll meet you here in Miletus? Because he was really in a rush to get to Jerusalem. And he probably knew that if he went back to Ephesus, it was going to take a lot of time because the church had exploded. I mean, we, when you read chapter 19, you find that, that many turned to Christ and the word of God prevailed in that city. So it was probably a very large church and he knew, I, I can't spend too much time there. And so he just calls for the elders and they'll come up to Miletus and, and they would just take, oh, a 30 mile stroll short walk from Miletus to come and meet him. And Paul knows, since he won't have time with the church of Ephesus, that if he can instill his heart into these leaders, if he can pass on his passion for the word of God and for godly leadership, that, that from the leaders it will trickle down into the church. And we just begin to listen Let's follow along to this preeminent minister of Christ as we read of his commitment to the Lord. Verse 18, and it says, And when they had come to him, that is the elders, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. And how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. Verse 21, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul in his address starts with his own life. He says, notice, in what manner I always lived among you. His lifestyle represented all that he believed. Paul was an open book, wasn't he? You knew what kind of guy he was. He wasn't any different behind closed doors than he was outdoors. He was the same guy. And he presents his life in God. Because his life in God had substance. It had character in Christ long before he even spoke about the master that he served. You know, Paul wasn't like the dad who told his son, son, do what I say, but don't do what I do. There was, there was no inconsistency in Paul's life. And he says, you know from the first day that I was among you what kind of man I was. He says, serving the Lord with all humility. Paul, he lived under the conviction that by serving the Lord Jesus Christ, he was actually serving people. That he was to serve people. And that was in loving service to his Lord. And he did so with humility. Paul loved people. And he loved these elders. And he's trying to pass on to them his servant heart and his humility, which he knew, first of all, came from Jesus Christ. So that those elders would go back to the church and exhibit the same 
love and same humility. Paul knew that serving the Lord means serving others. You know, people ask, how is it that I can serve the Lord? Sometimes we have these grand notions of serving the Lord and big things that we're going to do for the Lord when the Lord just simply asks us to serve others. And by serving others, that's how we serve Him. And by the way, ministry, it's not easy. It's not easy loving others. It's not always easy loving you guys. But when I love with Christ love, it is. And I'm called to it, and you're called to it, and you're called to love one another. But ministry is not meant to be easy. But it was meant to humble us. Paul puts ministry and serving humbly in the same breath because ministry does humble us. And when we are humble, that is when God exalts us. Paul understood this. And yet he says that he also served with many tears and with many trials there. It reminds me of the impassioned prophet Jeremiah. Often called the weeping prophet. Paul's tears, they just flowed from his eyes. He was an emotional man, but he was a man. But he knew that there was something to cry over. There was something to be emotional about. And, and there's three things I believe you can find in Scripture that, that just made the tears of Paul flow. First of all, he cried over those who did not know Christ. You find that really striking in Romans chapter 9. In the first few verses, he cried over those that were damned. He cried also in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. You can just almost hear Paul's raw emotion coming through where he speaks of struggling with immature believers. Immature believers made Paul cry. And we're going to find in, in verse 29 and 30 that Paul, he cried over false teachers. This kept him up at night in prayer. Praying over the damage that false teachers would cause to the faith of those that had come to Christ. Paul's every action was a radiant example of Christ. But so was his message. You see there he says, he kept back nothing. And then it says he proclaimed. And then he says that I taught you publicly and from house to house there in verse 20. He didn't hold out on what his audience needed to hear. He didn't hold back from telling the Ephesian elders and the church just what they needed to know. And what was that? Well, previously in chapter 19, while Paul was in Ephesus, it says there for two years, Paul taught. And he taught the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, I kept nothing back from you. I gave you all that was required for you to hear. And that is the word of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. On Wednesday night, I've started teaching the book of Amos. And uh, there are words from, from his prophetic book that I think are so important, so appropriate in these crazy times that we live in. Because the prophet was told in Amos chapter 11, or pardon me, chapter 8, verse 11, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. That was the famine. Though there was teaching, even in the days of Amos, there was a famine of those that would hear God's word. And Paul says, this is what was required. I didn't keep it back. I didn't keep it to myself. Your souls are famished, and so I gave you the word of the Lord. Next, we see in the ministry of, 
the Apostle Paul that he also went publicly teaching and he also went house to house. Paul went to the public synagogue and and then Acts 19 to the school of Tyrannius. And he spent time with individuals, teaching them also from house to house. But what was the content of Paul's speech? There it is at the end of verse 21, or pardon me, in verse 21, Paul says he testified to Jews and also to Greeks of repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That was what Paul did not hold back from speaking of. And and we'll return to this and, and get into this more in a couple of verses. But Paul goes on, verse 22. He says, And see now, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me, But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Here we're we're listening to this pastor's conference with these elders. And I know some of you are going, well, I'm not a pastor I'm not an elder, but there are so many important things in in the speech of Paul here for our lives. First of all, Paul spoke of the hardships that he was made, made aware of that were going to come his way as he heads towards Jerusalem. Maybe it was that as he went from city to city, sometimes he walked. Remember, there was a plot against him in the last chapter So he walked a ways into Macedonia. And as he traveled, he probably met disciples along the way who would give him words of prophecy from the Holy Spirit. I think that's how the Holy Spirit was testifying to him. Telling him that there would be chains and there would be tribulations that would await him. You see, ever since Paul's life was rerouted on the Damascus Road. You remember that? Amazing, in fact. As Paul traveled without knowing God, going to kill Christians, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him. And ever since the Lord rescued this man, he faced one difficulty after another. And he knew that more was coming. In fact, it was Ananias who told Paul Jesus' words after Paul's conversion. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And I I know we don't like to hear this, but suffering and difficulties are part of the Christian life, part of the Christian walk. Now, I don't know how I would have done if I were told everything I would have faced after coming to know Jesus Christ, like Paul was told, sometimes the Lord tells us, sometimes he gives a clue, but know that there is hardship that awaits you. And I'm sorry, but that's the truth. But you see, Paul could say these words, though, He says, not knowing the things that will happen to me there. And yet none of these things move me. You see, first of all, Paul, he says he's uncertain of what exactly is around the corner. I mean, he has some inclination of the hardships, but he doesn't know exactly. And so Paul is in this place where even where things are a little bit unpredictable ahead of him. Paul shows his commitment to God. And he has this attitude that just comes from Christ himself, where he says, but none of these things move me. Nothing could budge Paul. Nothing. I mean, read what he goes through in Corinthians. In the second book, he's shipwrecked. He's whipped. He's beaten. 
He has trials among false brethren. I mean, the list goes on and on, and he says, none of these things move me. And Paul right now, he's unsure of of what's going to happen. But you know what? His life, he says, is not dear to himself. You know, you might ask yourself, how is it that a person could be so immovable when there's so much uncertainty around him? Here it is, guys. It's because his life was not dear to himself. He learned the lesson that his life was hidden in Christ in God. He learned that his life was not his own. He says, my life is not dear to myself. And this this same God-given attitude is yours. It's mine through Jesus Christ. And it belonged to a man by the name of James Calvert and his wife. They were Methodist missionaries, and they were sent out in the 1800s to a cannibalistic tribe living on the Fiji Islands. Well, the ship captain, before they got to the islands, was really concerned for the missionaries and their welfare. They were going to witness to cannibals. So the ship captain said, you're going to lose your life and the lives of those that are with you If you go among such savages. Well, Calvert, not moved from his commitment, replied in in that same attitude that the Apostle Paul has here. He said to the captain, we died long before we came here. We died long before we came here. See, Paul didn't know exactly what was in the future for him. Yet he wasn't panicking over the uncertainty. And and I think there's something that the Spirit of God wants to teach us in that. Is it just me? Because how many of us panic, get out of sorts, when we don't even know what we're going to eat the next day? (laughs) Or over choices, or over things going on in our lives. You see, one of the hardest lessons for us is to completely trust God without any condition. When things are unsure. And really, when it comes down to it, what causes us to be uncertain in our lives and not have this this rock-solid faith that was unmovable like Paul is when we count our lives as more dear to us than we should. When my life is dear to myself, that's when the struggle comes. When I'm always wanting to know, you know, what's next? How do I avoid that, (laughs) right? Uh, And thinking I have to be just two steps ahead. You see, our lives cannot be held so dear to us without us being moved to panic. But when when we are in that place of settled faith, like Paul was, we can say, none of these things move me. When our lives are bound up in Jesus' life, we can say, regardless of the unknown, I know who I'm relying on. He's the first. He's the last, right? He's the beginning. He's the end. Everything in between. None of these things move me. And we can sing with David from Psalm 16, 8. David said, I have set the Lord always before me. And because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. None of these things move me. Well, next here, Paul He takes up the image of an Olympic runner for himself. He said there that he has to finish his race. He was just in Corinth not long ago, and that's where the games were were held, the Olympics of the day. And so he compares his Christian life to a race that he has to finish. 
And he says, it is my race. He says, he doesn't say it's a sprint. He says it's a run. It's got some distance to it. And Paul is saying, this is my race. And I have to finish that race and complete it with God's permanent joy. When at last he crosses that finish line. And what's on the other side of the finish line? Glory. Heaven. He says that I might finish that race. He doesn't say to the leaders of the church, your race. He personalizes it, doesn't it? Because each of us have a race to run. We literally have a lane to stay in. A course of life that God has set out before us. Paul teaching us that you must serve with humility and you must know the message of repentance towards God and faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ sets us on this race of life. Paul says, this is my race. And as he runs, he says, he does so to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. You see that there? You see, in verse 24, the ministry that that Jesus gave to Paul was to testify. So Paul, it's like he, he, he he puts down the track shoes, and now he brings up another image, and that of one who is standing in court as a witness beneath the law before the judge, And Paul is saying, I testify, I'm a witness who takes the stand. And he says, I'm showing and I'm speaking of God's grace. And I'm going to run that race and I'm going to talk about this grace of God until I reach the finish line where Jesus will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter the rest. Paul speaks of this saving grace since a person is saved by god's free and undeserved gift that was purchased by god there's no better description for the message that paul carried and lived by and had in him and that was the gospel of the grace of god paul said in in another letter in titus chapter 2 verse 11 For the grace of God that brings salvation, right, has appeared to all men. God's grace brings that salvation down to us. But there must be the reception of that grace on the part of the sinner. And I told you I would come back to verse 21. But Paul there in verse 21 had spoke of testifying. And he spoke of the message that he preached. And here he speaks of the gospel of grace. And so just putting it together, we see that Paul is saying that this gospel of grace is really received by repentance. A repentance that is towards God. While there must also be simultaneously this faith in Jesus Christ. Paul speaking of this message that will save us that involves personally changing our mind and turning around. And then with hope, hopeful open arms saying, God, it is your grace that saves me. You know, there are many who have only nodded to the gospel of grace. Who have only thought fondly of the gospel of grace. Oh, that sounds really nice. There are those that have have prayed a prayer in church or raised their hand in church, but they haven't understood and totally received the gospel of grace because it has to involve repentance. Paul said that's the first part. Repentance towards God. You have to recognize in the very presence of God, you're a sinner. You're awash. You're undone, in the words of Isaiah. But at the same time, in that very moment where you recognize by the Spirit of God that you're a sinner, you cry out to God for grace. And you trust Him. 
This is the biblical gospel. It's not a reform over our morals, but it's a transformation that comes about this way. Where you turn from your sins and you turn to Jesus Christ. There is no more appropriate name for this message than the good news of the grace of God. Well, Paul continues here his impassioned farewell. Verse 25. And he says, And indeed, now I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock of God among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now to those who heard him, to those he went among preaching the kingdom of God, Paul first preached to these Ephesian elders and they got saved. And as Paul's pattern was on his missionary trips, wherever he would go preaching the gospel, he would gather those new believers and begin to disciple them. And then over time, he would appoint elders, leaders in every church. He says, I went among you testifying. And then again, he, he pulls up the image of a witness standing trial. And he's saying, and he's, it's like he's swearing in court before God. And he says, I'm innocent of the blood of all men. Think of those words. To say that you're innocent. He, he was innocent in that he did his duty before God. He did what he was asked to do. He's done what was required of him, and he did so through God. He did it all through God. We know that, that Paul was this incredible minister of God because of what God was doing through him. And so he had nothing to be proud of. It was a long time ago, and I just love to refer to the, to the old men of God, especially in the 1800s and the 1900s, where you can, you can track their whole life. You see the course that they ran from beginning to end. But one such man, his name was uh, George Whitfield. And George Whitfield used to gather crowds of people. They would come, and sometimes they would come from, from the coal mines on their lunch break, and they would just listen to to George Whitfield preach the gospel and there were stories of the of the tear stains on the cheeks of these coal miners because their faces were covered with black soot as they would just weep before the gospel of grace well George Whitfield was so captivating people and so many were coming to listen to him that he got a lot of praise from man and so whenever people would praise him he would tell them this he would say, well, the devil told me that those same words just before I came down from the pulpit. He wouldn't take praise. And then he would also add to that, he would say, there are many who can preach the gospel better than I can, but none can preach a better gospel. He was always humble about it. Because nobody could preach a better gospel. And he knew he was just a man that God had and that God was using. And I, I have no doubt that when Paul said, I'm innocent of the blood of all men, he was, he was referring to Ezekiel the prophet. Now, if you've read the book of Ezekiel, there's some strange things there. You almost think you're reading about UFOs or something. And he was asked, Ezekiel was asked to do some strange things by God in obedience, right? Walk around almost half naked and, and, and burn some dung and, and lay on your side for all this time. He did some very weird things out of obedience to God. But in, in chapter 3 of the book of Ezekiel, Yahweh told him to give Israel warning. He was to warn Israel. And he was to warn them of their wickedness. And you can go on and read it more for yourself. 
But if Ezekiel warned the wicked and they turned, then Ezekiel was off the hook. He was innocent. But if Ezekiel held back and did not speak to them, he was guilty. God said, I require their blood at your hands. And this is what Paul has in mind. He says, I am innocent of the blood of all men. And he said that. He said that there was no blood on his hands because he said, I have told them the whole counsel of God. I've given them every part. I've told them all. Everything that they needed to hear to be saved, I've given it to them. Now, what was Paul considering the whole counsel of God when he said these words? The whole of Scripture. The entirety of Scripture. You mean Paul taught him from Leviticus? I, I bet he did. The whole of Scripture, every book of the Old Testament, the whole counsel of God, that is what Paul gave them. Remember, Paul was in Tyrannius for two, or sorry, in the school of Tyrannius in Ephesus for two years teaching them. It's a lot of hours of teaching. And so he's counseling them, speaking to them through the counsel of God's word. The whole book. I like what somebody said. I don't know who it was, but I'll borrow it. They said it takes the whole counsel of God to make a whole Christian. To make us whole. To make us complete. A steady diet of topical sermons. A short, short little message with the scripture here and there. Or inspirational talk and a tidbit of truth. Will not feed you. You need the whole counsel paul says i'm not guilty i haven't held it back i've taught you all you know i'm under obligation as i stand in this pulpit before you i'm under obligation by god to teach you the word of god that's why we teach verse by verse here book by book because i don't want to stand guilty before god and, and the Bible does say that teachers will be judged more strictly. James chapter 3. But I know I am clean and clear before God if I give you the whole counsel. Because what's the counsel of God going to do for you? It's going to build you up. It's going to lead you to the Lord. It's going to grow you. You're going to have a deeper relationship with God as you go through His Word. And so I'm not here to entertain, but I'm here to expound the whole of this book for you. And you're to hold me accountable for that. Do you know that? And you're to be those that receive the whole counsel of God. How wonderful this is as Paul rehearses this. And then he says to the Ephesian elders, take heed to yourselves. Take heed to yourselves. You see, first of all, these leaders, and it's true for us, we have to take heed to ourselves and make sure that, our, that we are being helped by God's word before we can help anyone else. So Paul says, you take heed to yourself, take personal inventory. And then he tells them to look after the flock of God. The flock of God which the Holy Spirit had made them overseers of. Notice here in verse 28, the elders, same group of guys leading in the church, in verse 17, is called in verse 28, overseers. Do you see that? An overseer is one who looks over the church of God. They are to be spiritual supervisors. And it's God's church. And in this verse here in 28, I would like you just to notice quickly three terms. Three terms that apply to the same team of leaders. And I'll just mention these Greek words. Well, you say, well, it's all Greek to me. But, listen, three Greek words, but they're all describing and speaking of the same group of leaders. First of all, there is the word from elder, elder, 
presbyteros, where we get our word Presbyterian. It, it means to elder. And then also, here in verse 28, the word overseer means to supervise, as I said. It can be translated bishop, but it is the Greek word episkopos. And then notice here, there is also a description of what the leaders are to do. They are told to shepherd, or King James, feed the flock of God. That's where we get our Greek word poimano. And poimano is where we get our English word pastor. So you see, the elders are overseers chosen by the Holy Spirit, supervising God's church. It's not their church. Elders, we know this, right? Elders of RCF, we know this isn't God's church. We remind ourselves, we pray, we say, God, this is your church. It's his. But we are supervisors of his church, and we've been given the responsibility of leading and feeding God's flock as pastors. Pastors describing the activity of feeding God's flock. And this is the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Did you see that phrase there? Curious phrase, isn't it? No, I thought God couldn't bleed. God is spirit, isn't he? God is spirit. And yet, in the grace of God, God became man. And this is the Christmas message. In the grace of God, God became man with this incredible purpose of rescuing us to be born a human, to die as a human, to purchase us for himself. Paul says, God purchased us with his own blood. The unique blood of Jesus Christ was the only blood that could save us from sin. His own blood. We are bought. We are paid for by his blood. Paul goes on to say, this is what the leaders are to look out for. They are to be overseeing, but this is what they're to look out for. He says in verse 29, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. That word overseer really displays that tender care and that vigilant guard that God's leaders are to have over the church. And it's because of false teachers. False teachers and false prophets who would come into the church, not only from the outside, but look what Paul says. He says, they will come from among you. False teachers from the inside that will try to lead people astray from the grace of God. They will pervert the word of God. You know, Paul is... is really speaking directly from the Lord himself, who said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 through 16, Beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. He says them, to them, you will know them by their fruits. I thought somebody cleverly put together this picture. Can't see the wolf, can you? He's got the right outfit on for being among the sheep, doesn't he? How can you tell a wolf? It's when they smile. Got those big fangs, right? Smell their breath. They eat lamb chops. They're ravenous. They're ravenous wolves. They're covetous. They're self-interested by their very core. They only... Live for themselves, you'll know them by their fruits, Jesus said. 
And Paul warned that they will speak perverse things. And Paul is warning them with tears. But verse 32, this is how they will make it. This is how the church of God will survive the assaults of these false teachers from within and without. He says, now then, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. How are you going to make it? Here it is, guys, the word of grace. I give it to you. I commend you to it. Like an athlete who would run a race. Like a, like a man who would stand in the court of law and swear and know that he was telling the truth. Have that dedication to the word of his grace. It is able to build you up. The 66 books of God's grace unfold that grace for us so that we might be fed, so that we might be warned, so that we might spiritually grow. You see, there's something in the Christian church that I think we need to just be very aware of. There's, there are many books out there on the Bible. There's devotional books. There's so many things that you can pick up about the Bible. But you know what? The books that talk about the Bible aren't the Bible, are they? Right? It, reading the Bible is not the same as reading books about the Bible. And so don't neglect the word of his grace. 66 books of grace, all of it of the grace of God, the word of his grace. Stay in his word. And this is not only a priority for ministers, for elders and pastors, but it is a priority for you as the flock of God to feed yourself, to stand in his grace. Well, Paul's going to close his words here expressing his commitment. And not only his commitment to these elders to teach them, but also his commitment to give of himself. We'll finish here. He says, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities for those who are with me. And I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. See, this really wraps up Paul's ministry motto. He's saying farewell to them, but he reminds them it was never about people's stuff for him, was it? It wasn't about the silver. It wasn't about the gold. Paul had the right to live by preaching the gospel, but he didn't take that privilege. Instead, he worked hard among them. And then notice how Paul's very last words here is a direct quote from Jesus, not found in the Gospels, but a quote from Jesus that Paul knows, where Jesus says it is more blessed to give than to receive. I can't think of a more appropriate scripture in this season. It is more blessed to give than to receive. For who was the one who first gave? It was the Father. The Father so loving the world that he gave. His only begotten son. I want to read Kenneth Weiss. His translation of Jesus' words here. Where he says, There is more spiritual prosperity in constantly giving than in constantly receiving. This is an inversion from man's methodology, isn't it? This is all counterintuitive to the world where that says get more you know hoard grab get bigger and better and and god says you want spiritual prosperity give 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 as you give out though he will give himself to you he will fill you up your cup will run over you can't outgive god can you 
And besides, he who gave you his own son, Jesus, Paul would say, will he not with him also freely give you all things? He is the giver. And at last, Paul has spoken this farewell address, and we read just the closing remarks by Luke here in verse 36 to the end of the chapter. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing mostly of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. Moving, emotional words. From this ideal minister as he poured out his life and he just embraces these elders for the last time. He knows, I'm not going to see you again. And it was that that probably just triggered the, the reaction by the elders. They're, they're laying on his neck. They're weeping. They're not going to see him. This ideal minister who served with humility, who taught them the word of grace. They were saved because Paul went to them and preached repentance towards God and faith in Jesus Christ. The man who taught them by his life, none of these things move me. None of these things. As we close in prayer, what's moving you? Let me just leave you with that. What's moving you? Are, is, is there uncertainty? Are you unsure about something? Are you constantly thinking, I got to be a step ahead? You know what? Don't go there. You're just going to you're going to panic yourself into a mess. Right? Take to heart the words of Paul. I did not count my life as dear to myself, he said. None of these things move me. May you not count your life as dear to yourself and in exchange let the life of Christ be lived through you. Lord, I know I needed to hear that. I know I need to hear from your apostle. And so I pray for, for those that are listening and being fed by your word, that whatever it was that your spirit told them, if it was that they are maybe overly anxious or worried about things or unsure about things, I pray that God, your word, would just still them. And they would say, wait a minute, this isn't right. I thank you, Lord, through you, nothing has to move us. Nothing. And Lord, I pray that you would help us through your grace to not count our lives as so dear, as so precious, but to run our race. We thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. As we